Welcome to this week's Money Meadows podcast, helping gold and silver investors during these turbulent times. Now, here's this week's market wrap with commentary and analysis from the low-cost precious metals dealer voted best in the U.S., Money Meadows Exchange. Welcome to this week's Market Wrap podcast. I'm Michael Eason. Later in today's program, we'll hear from David Morgan of The Morgan Report, and we highlight a very interesting setup in the silver market that could lend itself to significantly higher prices. David also shares his thoughts on the price levels he wants to see before getting too excited, and he updates us on the gold-to-silver ratio. So stick around for another great interview with David Morgan coming up after this week's market update. Gold and silver markets continue to be trapped between support and resistance levels. The precious metals treaded water through Thursday's close, trading little changed on the week. As of this Friday recording, gold prices come in at $1,334 an ounce, up 0.6% on the week. Silver trades up 0.2% this week to $16.44 per ounce. Turning to the platinum and palladium markets, a more bearish picture took shape this week. Platinum posts a 2.1% weekly loss to come in at $916. The platinum to gold ratio has now broken down to an historic new low below 0.7 to 1. Platinum now represents one of the greatest relative value opportunities that's ever existed in the metal space. But investors will have to be patient, as platinum has traded at a discount to gold for more than three years now, and it isn't showing any signs of positive momentum at the moment. Meanwhile, palladium prices took a 5% hit this week to trade at $905 per ounce. Yes, it's just below platinum now. Palladium has taken it on the chin so far in 2018 after posting stellar gains in 2017. The world supplies of the platinum group metals come largely from South Africa. Mining output there is set to shrink significantly in the months ahead. Leading South African platinum producer Anglo-American Platinum has announced a freeze on new capital investment. Another South African major, Impala Platinum Holdings, is shutting down mining shafts and laying off workers to try to conserve cash amidst poor market conditions. South African miners also face growing political risk from the country's socialist and increasingly rapacious government. Property rights and the rule of law are now under threat in South Africa, and that could further discourage companies from investing in mining operations there. The ruling African National Congress recently moved to begin confiscating white-owned farms without compensation. Speaking of confiscation, it was 85 years ago, April 5, 1933, that U.S. President Franklin Delano Roosevelt issued his infamous gold confiscation order. Private citizens were ordered to turn in their gold in exchange for dollars. The government then devalued the dollar, robbing citizens of their purchasing power. There are a lot of myths about gold confiscation that persist today. Many of them are pushed by numismatic coin peddlers to try to scare investors into buying heavily marked up specialty gold coin products. Numismatic promoters claim that these types of coins are specifically exempt from confiscation. The reality is that under our current fiat monetary system, the government doesn't need gold in order to expand the currency supply. The government would have no particular reason to nationalize gold, and if it ever did, we have no way of knowing whether it would exempt numismatics. In the case of high-premium numismatic coins that are touted as, quote, confiscation-proof, the same supposed legal protection can be gained from American eagles. Popular gold and silver eagles are considered by law to be numismatic, even though they sell at closer to bullion prices. At the end of the day, getting more metal for your dollars is a better way to hedge against economic and political risk. During a crisis, you may need to sell or barter with portions of your precious metal stash. Graded coins and proof finishes are unlikely to command any premium. The most widely recognized bullion products in the most common sizes will be the most liquid and useful. Practically speaking, the government won't have any way of knowing how much gold you have, or in what form, or where it is stored, unless you disclose it yourself or own it through a bank or brokerage account. When the government ordered citizens to surrender their gold bullion in exchange for cash in 1933, it relied on people to come forward and comply. Some did. Many didn't. FDR's Executive Order 6102 prohibited the hoarding of gold bullion, but didn't authorize government agents to conduct random sweeps of home safes and bank vaults. Some safe deposit box were seized as a result of bank failures, but door-to-door -door gold confiscations never actually happened. The most immediate and most serious confiscation threat investors need to be concerned about is the threat of their purchasing power being confiscated 
through inflation. Dollars are virtually guaranteed to lose value over time as the national debt grows ever larger and more unmanageable. Converting depreciating dollars into physical precious metals is one of the best ways to protect yourself from the confiscatory currency debasement to come. Well now, without further delay, let's get right to this week's exclusive interview with the man they call the Silver Guru. It is my privilege now to welcome in our good friend David Morgan of The Morgan Report. David, it's always a real pleasure to have you on, and welcome back. How are you, sir? Michael, I'm doing well. Thank you very much for having me on the show. Well, David, we've seen a tremendously tight trading range in the metals markets over the last several months, especially in silver. And, and before we get into some other topics with you today, I wanted to get your thoughts on what these prolonged periods of a range trade or a base building market generally means uh, for us moving forward. I mean, when you see this type of thing on the charts for one of the precious metals or for some other commodity for that matter, I know you cover a lot of different markets. Does it mean that we're likely to see a big move one way or the other? Is it a bullish indicator that we're building a major base of support from which to launch? What do you think? Well, I know what, and it's not me, it's not, you know, David Morgan. It's basically watch anyone that really studies markets at all. I mean, if you look at what happened with silver after the big move in January of 1980, I mean, it built a base around the $5 level for years. And I give the analogy, and it's very similar to building a base as a triathlete or a long-distance runner. The longer your base, the better your base, the better your, it will be your race. And what that means is the longer it goes in this consolidation or base-building period, between roughly 15 and you know, 18, let's say, the bigger the move will be the upside. I don't see much downside here. In fact, the market is very clear at this point in time, in both gold and silver, that all the lows have been higher lows, which means we're in a new bull market. Now, it's a very stealth bull market. No one's really paying much attention to it, except for some of the technicians in the gold space and some others, some smart money, some big money, actually. But it means that we're going to go far higher at some point. And, of course, as my famous coined phrase, the silver market will either wear you out or scare you out. We're in the wear you out phase. It's just droning on sideways day after day, week after week, month after month. And most people are just entirely tired of it. And they've moved on. They've sold their silver or whatever. A lot of people have left the market. There has been a fair bit of focus on the commitment of traders' data lately. You can cover that in this month's edition of the Morgan Report. Uh, now, on the surface, the setup has looked quite bullish for silver, with the bullion banks reducing their short position and speculators going net short for the first time in more than a decade. Uh, given that the banks usually wind up winning against the speculators, this looks like uh, silver prices could be heading north. But you've been uh, digging a little bit deeper into that data, and there is uh, some reason for pause. Not everything in the report is bullish. Uh, we'd like to get your current assessment on the commitment of traders, uh, but first, if you would explain a bit more about the COT, what it is, because there are many listeners out there likely who may not be familiar with that report or, or how it can be used to forecast price moves. Certainly. The commitment of traders reports are produced for, I think, almost all the commodities. And it basically shows what the big money is doing versus the speculative money. And the big money in corn are the corn producers. The big money in wheat are the wheat producers. The big money in any commodity are basically, usually, the producers of the commodity. Now, when you go to silver, it's a little different because the commercials are the big money. And it's commercials is how it's uh, quantified in the Commitment of Traders Report. So the commercial interests are those that have a commercial activity in wheat, rice, corn, but in silver, is it the miners that are the commercials and the answers? Not really. The commercial interests are primarily the banks, which have the books of the big producer. So a big producer of silver would be a huge conglomerate like Rio Tinto or Broken Hill Properties, BHP Billington, or some of the larger gold mines, or some of the primary silver mines. And they, the banks, will have the access to basically what their 
output is, and they'll do the quote-unquote hedging for these entities, and they will trade for themselves in their own account and or trade for their customers. So the commercials in the silver industry are primarily the large bullion banks. And again, just to try to clarify that the bullion banks do a great deal of work with some of the larger uh, producers of silver, primarily on the base metal side. In other words, these large conglomerates I just named. So the other side are what's called trading funds or speculative funds, and these are commodity funds that uh, the public can basically buy into, and they buy a, a fund that trades commodities for them. They put up their money, and they win, lose, or draw based on how the commodity fund performs. There's also trading funds that are unique to family offices or a hedge fund in particular, so I can't categorize them all as being the same, but the Commitment of Traders reports puts all speculative trading funds in the same category, and I think that's accurate. And the last category is basically the public, which holds very little as far as contract size, but they do definitely make up part of the speculative interest. So to boil it down very simplistically, you've got commercial interest versus the speculative interest. Now, the commercial interest win almost every time, and it depends on the commodity, but we're talking silver here, and physical demand is a very small percentage of what the paper interests show on any given day in the commodities exchanges. And this isn't just true of silver, although silver is exceptional as far as the amount of difference between physical demand and the amount of paper behind it. But all of them, you look at, uh, again, the corn market, the wheat market, the lumber market, cocoa, cotton, doesn't matter. It, whatever you look at, the amount of actual physical commodity that comes off the exchange relative to the amount of paper that supports a contract is minuscule, usually in the 1%, 2% range. So that's not that unusual. You can't just point so say, look, there are only 1% that ever comes off the exchange versus all these paper contracts. It's also true in most commodities. Again, silver's a bit exceptional as there's such a huge difference between them. However, what happens is the price is set in the paper markets, and as long as there's enough physical to cover the physical demand, and so far with few exceptions there has been. So it goes like this. The game starts. Silver gets washed out. The price gets taken down, smashed, and a lot of these big smashes have been with massive amounts of selling. You'd only sell a massive amount in one click of the mouse, so to speak, if you wanted the price to go down. If you really wanted to get your best price for something, you'd sell it slowly over time and you'd slowly feed it into the market and see what the market could absorb. But that's not what's done, particularly in the silver market and gold market as well. And that is where these huge amounts of paper product are pushed onto the market massively and instantaneously. And there's only one repercussion for that, and that is massive price movement to the downside. So let's say that has just taken place. When that takes place, the commercial interests have just won a great deal of money because they were short the market all the way up. So once the smashing down takes place and the market stabilizes, the open interest or the amount of players in the market has substantially reduced, which means that it's gone from a number of like 200,000 open interest to 100,000 open interest. I'm just giving for round numbers for the idea. And now once the market is down at the bottom, I say, as I've stated many times, the game is ready to begin again, which means that the trading funds that are habitually long versus the commercials that are habitually short, remember I was talking specifically silver now, the price starts to move up. And as more contracts are bought by the trading funds and the speculative interest, then more the other side of the contract is taken by the commercial interest. So up goes the price, up, 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 and then it gets to basically a level where the open interest has increased from the 100 back to the 200, and the trading funds are basically out of money. They only have so much money to allocate to the silver market because they spread out between the agricultural markets, the financial markets, the softs, and everything else, and there's so much for the metals, and they're out of money. And, of course, the commercial banks basically know that, and so then they pull another one of these selling massive amounts of silver on paper. There isn't anybody to match the orders with, 
so the price drops until the orders match, which means it usually falls just straight down, and then the orders start to match, and then you get this big washout again, and the game starts over because the open interest goes again from 200 down to 100. Yeah, so rinse and repeat. So uh, with that said, if you will, give us the highlights on what recent COT reports have been showing, what looks like good news for silver prices, and what, if any, uh, flies are in the ointment. So what's happened now is that the setup for the silver market is probably the best I've seen for a very long time because the commercial interests are almost long. I mean, they're short of very few contracts, which is a setup for the game to begin over again. And the speculative trading funds are very short the market, and the market's at a low. And so this looks like a great setup, and many people have commented on this. I mean, everybody, TF Metals, Craig Hemke, uh, I think somebody from Sprott, I mean, almost everybody has commented on this, and they're all correct. I mean, the facts are, as I just outlined. The one thing, however, that I wrote in the Morgan Report that has me concerned is that we're starting at a level where the open interest is extremely high. In almost all the cases I can think of over the last 20 years or so, when we're in a condition like this that was highly favorable for the price of silver to move to the upside, the trading funds have been washed out and taken advantage of, and the open interest have come way back down from my 200 to 100 in this analogy. And we're not there. We're more like at 200 at the bottom of the market, which means that it gave me pause, Mike. And I thought, well, if everyone's thinking the same, no one's thinking very much. So I'm really not sure what it means. It could mean that any move up would cause the speculative funds to be very, very much in a short squeeze because they don't have much money left to devote to silver and have to buy back massively to prevent further losses. That's a possibility, which is extremely bullish. Or there could be something else going on here. I actually have an open position I'm ready to do. I gave it to my paid members on the you know, look over my shoulder service where I show them the trades that I'm doing, but I want the market to prove it to me. I'm not too interested in exactly how it gets there. Of course, I will be looking at how it got there, meaning you know, what the open interest looks like once it achieves this parameter that I've stated. But until that happens, I'm very willing to just watch the market. So very interesting I don't think anyone has an extremely good uh, reason why we're at such a great setup for silver to move up higher with what I consider an alarming open interest. But that's that's the state of affairs currently. Really good uh, summary there and gives uh, people an inside look at exactly how that works and does drive a lot of these markets, what what those reports look like. Now, switching gears here, recently the Chinese began trading oil futures denominated in yuan as well as paying for oil imports using their own currency rather than the U.S. dollar. The volume of yuan oil futures trading is is already quite significant. Uh, It amounts to a Chinese assault on the decades-old homogeny of the dollar in oil trading. If successful, it will substantially weaken the dollar's position as the world's primary reserve currency. And now this comes at a time when uh, Trump has imposed tariffs on Chinese steel and aluminum, prompting officials there to retaliate. They're now imposing tariffs on U.S. imports and other uh, options may be that they escalate a trade war or wage a currency war by dumping U.S. dollars or U.S. treasuries. Uh, so there were already plenty of reasons to fear for the future of the dollar, but the outlook has suddenly gotten a lot worse, it appears. What do you make of these recent events? Uh, is King Dollar in true peril from China, or are these fears overblown, David? Well, I'm more inclined at my age and watching these markets for years to be of the idea that, you know, buy the rumor, sell the news. I think that the the consequences of moving oil into the yuan is extremely significant over time. But I think a lot of people are jumping up and down, shouting and screaming at this point in time because of that fact, are missing the longer-term view, which means that I don't see any real repercussions taking place immediately. I think over a longer period of time it certainly will, and I think it's it's meaningful. I think it's a, a substantial shift in the perception of the dollar. But again, I think that the uh, 
what's being made of it primarily in the financial press and, and particularly internet news maybe or alternative news it's overblown at this point in time so the dollar isn't doomed uh the dollar will continue to weaken and there obviously aren't as many dollars required to purchase oil and it's not a situation like we saw with Saddam Hussein or Gaddafi or these others that have tried to circumvent using the oil market and being paid only in dollars you're not going to see any of those repercussions happen to China. However, again, I don't think it's going to be a significant short term as most people are indicating. The precious metals markets are performing well on a relative basis. Stocks have recently seen some heavy selling. Bond prices have been falling as markets finally grapple with the idea of, of higher interest rates. And the dollar, which has been in decline for more than a year, looks like it could be headed lower still, as we just discussed. Uh, there have actually been some healthy gains in metals prices so far this year, yet the, the sentiment surrounding gold and silver, David, remains near rock bottom. I mean, these markets need some sort of a catalyst, either some fear or greed, uh, to drive demand and interest in the sector. As, as you look over uh, the months ahead, do you expect these markets will find that catalyst, or do metals investors just need to plan on hanging on there for a while longer? Well, it's difficult to answer. I mean, the facts are that gold is the most negatively correlated asset to the stock market. And I've already said on several shows like this that I believe strongly that the top is in for the equity markets, probably the bond market as well, which means that gold will have its day in the sun over time. I also think, as I said about the yuan trade for oil, that this might be more of a stealth market where we don't see we've already that could be the catalyst. In other words, the catalyst has already occurred, which means long term the stock market's going down, long term the gold market's going up. But it could take place in such a insignificant manner as far as meaning just these days up where, you know, gold's up five and then it's off three and then it's up six and it's off two and where it just kind of grinds up is how I like to frame it. So it's moving up, but not at all at such a significant way where anybody outside of the gold bucks are actually paying any attention, then all of a sudden we're at, you know, fourteen fifty, roughly a hundred dollars higher than we are today while we're doing the interview. And then we get what I call the my mys, which means more people that pay some attention to the financial markets go, My my gold's up to fourteen fifty. I didn't know that. Last time I was paying any attention to it, it was at thirteen fifty. So that's a possibility. Uh, is that exactly what's going to happen? I don't know. But the catalyst, I think, is actually there. And there could be other catalysts. I mean, I'd be remiss to say that more war drums, uh, more problems in the Middle East, uh, more problems with the European banks, that Deutsche Bank comes to the fore again, something significant with the trade war that's reportedly going on, and certainly tensions are increasing. So there's so many, and I'm almost tired of saying that black swans flying around out there, that certainly any catalyst could take place at any time. I could name several more, but I think it's immaterial at this discussion because the main catalyst is that the dollar continues to slide and the equity market and bond market for the U.S. dollar continue to slide. And everyone is basically trying, I should say everyone, <clears throat> Major entities such as nation states are trying to move out of dollar-denominated assets on a basis that's significant, which means the Asia Infrastructure Investment Bank, China going to the settlement and oil, as we just discussed. So these are major, major means to acquire assets that don't require the U.S. dollar. And this is another catalyst that's taking place, take, has taken place and continues to take place. So I think the idea for me is that we have to be patient here on the gold market. I really want to see gold break the 1350 level. I want to see it stay there on good volume, and I want to see it start working its way higher. Once that's accomplished, then I really demand to see silver start to catch up to gold. The gold-silver ratio has been very, very high up to like the 82 level, and I like the Gold-silver ratio, similar to the Dow theory, which means that uh, industrials have to be supported by the transportation index. And this is what I think about the metals markets. Once gold starts its move, and I say 1350 is a good round number, I want to see silver start to move up to you know 1750 
or whatever. And I want to see that ratio start to move down from 82 to 80. And I want to see it get below 72. I would be extremely satisfied that the market, not me, but the market has told us that we're up and away. Once we see gold above 1350, we see the gold-silver ratio below 72. That's what I'm looking for. Until then, uh, I'm building cash. I'm sticking with uh, the main investments that we've outlined in the Morgan Report. We just sold off two. Actually, one was bought out by Hecla, and the other one was a zinc-silver play that we had early on. We made some good money on that. We sold it to free up some cash. And I'm basically telling our members just to hold on to cash for a while. Let's see what happens, and let's not get impatient. Well, as we begin to wrap up here, David, give us your thoughts on the events you'll be watching most closely in the months ahead uh, when it comes to the metals markets. And then also, maybe do you have any advice for the beleaguered metals investor who's wondering when his day will finally come? Uh, Anything on the mining industry? Just uh, your closing thoughts here. Anything else that we haven't covered that you want to hit on before we leave? Well, I've already hit on it. What I'll be watching the most closely is how this uh, setup in the COT for silver unfolds because it's extreme. It's at a very extreme condition, and all of us kind of are on the same side of the boat. And as I said before, no one's thinking the same. No one's thinking very much. So I want to watch that and see what takes place. I want to see how the open interest comes down. So that's number one. Number two is, of course, the dollar and, and global political events. Anything that takes place that changes in the trading of the metals, in other words, if we start seeing a change in patterns on what the commercials are willing to do, uh, either gold, silver, or both, I think that's significant. And overall sentiment, I want to see the miners start to get catch a bid. I think if we all, if I am correct, and we've seen this, the change, the major shift from equities into gold, and it certainly looks that way, I want to see that proven to me by the market, as I just outlined. So I haven't really have much to add, Mike. I just think it's good to review those things. I think it's better to be solid on the fundamentals and what are the most important cases to look at rather than try to pull something out of the air and state, oh, I'm looking at this because I'm really not. Yeah, well put. I think it's always good to check your premises at times like this. And we've said it before, but it kind of does feel like the calm before the storm. Uh, Well, outstanding insights as usual, David. We always appreciate having you on and getting your thoughts on these important matters. Now, before we let you go, uh, please tell people how they can learn more about the Morgan Report and then what it is that they'll get if they do sign up and become a member. Well, the easiest thing to do is go to themorganreport.com. Just put in a... uh, a name and an email, you'll be asked to verify that it's you and you're not a robot, and then you'll be on. And in that weekly update I do every weekend, I do a weekly perspective that's for you. I also give you like some of our Twitter feeds, the podcast, what I do on YouTube, and all that's for you. I also usually answer a question every month or so that someone has sent in and asked me about, you know, what, for example, what do I think about the gold silver ratio at this point in time? Does it have meaning or not? That type of thing. For those that are so inclined that really want to make money in the resource sector, uh, oh, by the way, when you sign up for the free report, you'll be given a free report called Riches and Resources that outlines why we are still bullish on the resource sector. This is stuff that's needed, not wanted. In other words, commodities are the basic building blocks of, of everything, everything that you can't grow. And, of course, some commodities are food. Anyway, I digress. So I come back. The Morgan Report basically goes throughout the top tier, the mid tier, and the speculative sector. And we've been having extremely great success in the speculative portfolio the last several months. We have a technology stock that's basically going to disrupt not only the mining sector, but also the electronic waste sector. And this stock is up uh, from the 40 cent level up to as high as two bucks already. It's drifted back to about 160. Some of our mastermind members were able to acquire the stock at 25 cents. That's a long-term hold. I think it's going to go far higher than it is currently. So what I wanted to point out, Mike, and thanks for allowing me the time, is that we look at all the resource sector, and really what we've been having the best success with right now is basically technological breakthroughs in the mining sector that will be significant over time. Secondly, I'm going to be doing a mastermind series this month on another potential technology breakthrough using AI, artificial intelligence, in the mining sector. So that will be for our top-tier mastermind group. Uh, and they'll hear it first from the CEO. 
And I'm not sure if there's a financing opportunity available on that uh, particular company or not, but we'll learn that, you know, straight from the horse's mouth. So, so that's it. It's for serious investors, but it's just not just silver. Silver's part of it, but gold, the base metals, the rare earth elements, energy metals, everything else. So we cover, again, the gamut, and we've had great success making money even during this down period. And if I go back to gold and silver, there are certain companies that have a business model that makes money regardless of what the price movement is in the silver and gold markets. And some people are astounded to learn that. But if you go to our top-tier section, we have companies that are up 600% at this point in time, Mike, because, again, these companies make money regardless of what the, uh, the cash price is for, the, for gold, as an example. Yeah, if you're going to be in this market, uh, the mining sector or so forth, all these other resource types of investments, uh, somebody like David is about the best you can possibly follow. His track record is is truly fantastic. And there's a lot of stuff in the Morgan Report. We definitely urge people to, to check that out. Well, David, uh, thanks so much again. Appreciate catching up. Uh, we'll have to do it again soon and hope you have a great weekend. Thanks very much. My pleasure. Thank you, Mike. Well, that will do it for this week. Thanks again to David Morgan, publisher of The Morgan Report. To follow David, just go to themorganreport.com. We urge everyone to, at the very least, go ahead and sign up for the free email list and start getting some of his great commentary on a regular basis. And if you haven't already, be sure to check out either The Silver Manifesto or Second Chance, How to Make and Keep Big Money During the Coming Gold and Silver Shockwave. Uh, two great books, both of which are available at moneymetals.com and other places where books are sold. Be sure to check those out. And don't forget to check back here next Friday for our next weekly Market Wrap podcast. Until then, this has been Mike Leeson with Money Metals Exchange. Thanks for listening, and have a great weekend, everybody. Thank you for joining us for this week's Money Metals podcast. Be sure to come back next week. And don't forget to subscribe to our podcast through iTunes for answers to all of your questions or to discreetly and securely buy or sell gold or silver coins, bars, and rounds. Call 1-800-800-1865 or visit www.moneymetals.com. Our knowledgeable and no-pressure specialists are standing by between 7 a.m. and 5.30 p.m. Mountain Time, Monday through Friday. Or you can lock in your order online, 24 hours a day, 7 days a week. Again, visit us at www.moneymetals.com or call 1-800-800-1865.